computer. All right, cool. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Olivia had asked some questions just about like the different types of satellite data that's out there and what we have access to. Um, so I thought I would talk briefly about that like beforehand. And then I will spend most of the time going over EO browser, which is this like online platform for viewing most of the public um, like optical satellite imagery that's out there and which is I think the nicest thing available, if you're just like, I want to browse a random area of a random continent and like see how this thing changed through time, uh, which is probably what most of you guys are doing. Um, and maybe depending on how much time we have at the end, I can briefly show you Google Earth Engine, which is like, if you get to the point where you're like, I want to do analysis on all of this data for like, you know, 20 years worth of satellite imagery or something like that. That's the kind of platform you'd want to move to, um, but that involves a lot more like coding to control it. Um, so it's kind of a whole set of like tutorials in and of itself to like get started with that one. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat here um, in a sec. Uh, after... All right. Uh, so this is just a link to a Google Doc where I have dropped like a cheat sheet on satellite imagery that's out there that you might care about, um, like where the user guides are, or like what time periods they cover, um, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, uh, things you can just kind of like scroll through and take a look at. Uh, so I'll just kind of like run through the contents of this briefly um, to give you a sense of like what's out there that you might want to look at. Um, so as Olivia was like pointing out in her comment, there's kind of two sources of satellite imagery. There's the public stuff, which usually comes from somebody's space agency. And like the main two suppliers are basically NASA or like NASA collaborations and then ESA, so the European Space Agency. Um, there's occasionally random stuff like floating around from other people. Like there's one particular radar satellite, JAXA from Japan. Um, but like for most of the stuff you'd want to look at, it's probably either ESA or NASA um, for the public stuff. And then there's also commercial imagery, which is like companies that have put up their own satellites and are for the most part, like selling that data. Um, and so that stuff is usually not just like, oh, log on to a portal and like you can find it easily um, because they would like you to pay for it. But often the US government in one form or another has like contracts with these companies. And so there are ways that um, like funded investigators can get access to it. And you guys could like through use of Yao's grants, for example, get access to some of the stuff like if you wanted it for a particular project. Um, so typically like the trade-offs between these two things is like, so public imagery is covers like a longer time period for the most part. Um, so a lot of these things, if you look like they will have had satellites up since like the late eighties, maybe even the early seventies in some cases. Um, and so if you're like, if you need to go like really far back in time, the public stuff is usually, um, a little bit more useful for that. Uh, I would say the, the price on the public is it's generally the resolutions aren't as good as what you get with the commercial stuff. Um, so typically like with this, they're focused on like, we want a really reliable satellite that covers as much of the earth as possible. It's sort of reasonable revisit rates. Um, and then you tend to like lose some resolution on that. So the stuff um, that's like worth knowing about out there right now, if you're looking for typical like multi-spectral optical imagery, so this is like the stuff that looks like a camera on a satellite, right? Like kind of typical like true color imagery. There are other bands in there, but probably what you're looking at is just like the pictures. Um, the nicest stuff that's out there right now is going to be the Sentinel-2 stuff from ESA. So that's about 10 meter resolution. Um, you get, I think in principle, anywhere between like three to 10 day repeats, depending exactly where on the earth you are. Um, it's a little bit worse in Antarctica and a little bit better in Greenland. Um, but it's not bad. Um, so that's like the highest right now, like for optical imagery that you can get freely, that's kind of like highest resolution, highest repeat. The price is that they didn't launch those until late 2015. So you don't have like a really long record for it. Um, and so then kind of the backup to that is the Landsat um, series of satellites. So Landsat, like I will often just say like, oh, go look at Landsat. They're actually like an entire series of Landsat satellites starting from 1972. Um, so there's like Landsat 1 all the way up to the current Landsat 9 um, that are all kind of the same, but have maybe subtle differences in their like exact resolution or their revisit rates or something like between. Um, 
the different satellites, but you can kind of, they're a pretty continuous and like similar record across that whole time period, which is, which is pretty nice. Um, so those are somewhere between eight to 16 day revisit, um, but the resolution isn't as good. It's only about 30 meters um, for that one. But I would say if I'm going just to like look at pretty pictures of the ice sheet, like Sentinel-2 and Landsat are kind of my go-tos um, just for kind of like browsing and looking at stuff. Um, a couple other public ones that you might like think about. Um, so on the NASA side, you've got MODIS, which is mostly good for like really radiometrically calibrated stuff. Um, so its resolution is garbage. Like its best resolution band is 250 meters and most of it is more like 500 to a kilometer. But what's cool about it is that it has two day revisit rates like everywhere on the globe. And so you get like much better, you know, ability to watch like temporal change with this. The problem being if you're looking at small features like you just won't see them. Uh, so it's kind of a trade off. But I would say like on the ice side where like MODIS is in Greenland, for example, has been used a bunch for like tracking changes like ice sheet wide and like bare ice exposure or like the upper elevation of the runoff zone or something because you you know don't need to see fine scale features. You just need to see like, you know, ice albedo versus snow albedo or something like that. Um, so that's out there, but it's kind of like a secondary one for probably the stuff you guys are thinking about. And then on the ESA side, there's Sentinel-1, um, which is a synthetic aperture radar. So if you look like the stuff Niall was uh, showing on stuff where my page like uses a lot of that, um, it's harder to interpret because um, it's a radar system. And so you kind of have to spend a little time like <laughs> understanding radar to understand exactly what you're seeing in it sometimes. But like you do get sort of reasonable enough looking structures that if you kind of know something about glaciology, you can look at a picture and be like, okay, I, I see like this is a calving front or like that round thing is a lake or something like that. Um, so that one is kind of similar to Sentinel-2. It's all in the same series. So the data starts around 2014. Um, Resolution's not as good, it's like 50 meters for that. Um, but what is cool about this, right, is that it sees through clouds um, and it doesn't care whether it's day or night. And so you'll see going through Sentinel-2, it'll be like, oh yeah, we have five day repeat. And in a month, you know, 50% <laughs> of that is completely cloud covered. Um, so Sentinel-1 can be kind of a nice like gap filler if you're trying to like track a feature or something in between those. Um, yeah, so those are the big public ones you might care about. On the commercial side, which is like page two in the stock, um, there's either the Maxar stuff um, or there's the Planet Labs stuff. So Maxar were kind of, these were kind of the like first folks in the game with like really high resolution commercial satellites. So these do um, resolutions that are anywhere from about 30 to 50 centimeters, depending on which generation satellite you have. Um, so like when you can get this stuff, it's beautiful. You can see like half meter fractures on the ice sheet, like tiny streams, um, right? Like it's super beautiful. Its coverage is incredibly spotty, both in time and in space. Um, <laughs> like I think for Greenland, for like the areas I look at, you know, like you might have stuff going back to like 2011-ish and you might get like five random pictures of that area, like over the course of the year, or you might get one. And they're usually late spring to summer, um, but occasionally be like, we only got one picture in October. And you're like, that's useless, it snowed. Um, so if you can get it, it's amazing. Coverage is kind of bad. Um, the other thing with that one is that, so this is one digital, so they used to be digital, now Maxar. Maxar sells this. They also have massive contracts with like the US government on the intelligence side of the house. Um, and so there's kind of this like backdoor contract where the Polar Geospatial Center distributes all of the Maxar stuff to like science researchers through coordination with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And so the only way you get access to this stuff is if you are an investigator with a funded award from NASA Cryosphere Sciences Program or NSF, NSF Office of Polar Programs. Um, and so you have to like give them the actual grant award number and then like tell them exactly what data you want and they like process it and send it to you on an FTP server. Um, but the good news is that like Yao does have grants. And so like you guys could get accounts with Yao's grant number uh, approved to like get your own stuff. And they are not actually that picky. Like you have to give them an award number, but they're not really checking like what you use the data for. Like I've been getting data from PGC for like near surface stuff in Greenland on like a Greenland basal water grant that like Dusty's had open for like eight years. Um, definitely have like published papers that are only barely about Greenland, like <laughs> using that. Um, 
So you just you have to have something like they need to be able to check a box for their due diligence, but it's not like, oh, if I don't have a grant on like this specific project, they're not that picky. Um, you probably can't be like, oh, I have a grant on Antarctica, like send me Greenland data. But if you're on the right continent and you have a grant number, like that's usually good enough to get access um, with their stuff. And I have a link in there. You can browse um, all of the imagery at like low resolution. So they've blurred it to like, you know, five meters or something, uh, but that's like publicly open online. And so if you want to use this stuff, basically you can go in there first, browse around and see what's available to like see if it's even worth contacting PGC and then like send them the catalog numbers of like, oh, I saw these images on like the discover portal, you know, can you send me that stuff? Uh, so that's Noxar. And then kind of the new um, kids in the game but doing cool stuff is the Planet series. So their tactic is instead of having like three really big, really fancy satellites, they have like 130 very small like CubeSat style satellites. Um, and so they are kind of like the new and coolest thing in terms of like best resolution and also best revisit rates. Um, so I think most of their imagery is now three to five meter resolution, um, but they, their whole tagline is that they get the whole globe once a day. Um, so in principle, like you could get, you can do really nice sort of like feature tracking, and like watch stuff evolve um, with that. So there are, are a couple of ways to get a hold of the planet stuff. So one thing you can do like today when you get off this call that requires nothing is you can sign up for an educational account with them. Um, and so you just have to like fill out this whole kind of like Google form equivalent where you tell them like what you're interested in working on and like you need to have your institutional email associated with it. Um, but I signed up for this when I was a PhD student. Like, you know, it takes like a week. They just review your stuff in the background and they'll probably give you access um, as long as you can like describe your project coherently. Um, there's limits on how much of the data you can access. And I think like exactly what part of the archive you have access to, I didn't end up using it that much. Um, so I didn't play with it at all that much um but it, like if you're really interested in that stuff like that's the first thing is just like get the educational account like play around with it and see what they have um and then if you're really into it and you don't want like a ton of data from them um nasa has this uh csda program commercial satellite development something or other um where they like buy data and then distribute it uh to people who have funded grants um so again you have to have an active grant to get stuff through csda um I don't know if you have to directly request their support or if you can do it post hoc like you do um, with PGC, but that's like a thing to explore. And then apparently ESA also has like an archive of the planet stuff um, where they're just like, oh, sign in here and like fill out a request access. Not clear like what the actual eligibility is. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like once you go to that form, then they start asking you for like European grant numbers or something. Um, so that one may be less useful, but it's like a thing that there, there is a link there that makes it sound like maybe you could just request access to the ESA archive as well. Uh, let's see. All right, yeah, so that's kind of the spectrum of stuff that's out there that I think would be like the most popular imagery you guys might want to use. Um, so what I will show you now is how to look at any of the public stuff that we talked about um, in EO browser, which is probably the nicest way to look at it. So I'll just, uh, I'll share my screen, but if you scroll to the bottom of page two, um, there's a link to EO browser, this app.sentinelhub.com link. Um, if you guys wanna like follow along or look at it in your browsers while I'm screen sharing stuff. So, sharing this. Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, so this is EO browser. Um, you technically don't have to have an account or log in to use it, um, but some of the features only work if you're logged in. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, log in here. If you don't have an account yet, if you click on login, then it'll like give you an option to sign up for account. You basically just have to give them your email address and your name and like that's it. Um, so pretty straightforward. So. Yeah, once you get logged in, um, I guess the main sort of components of this is that you've got like your map view of whatever your area you're interested in. And then the big box on the left-hand side is where you do like all of your search parameters to try and find imagery. And then you've got all the little buttons on the right, which are for various like actions that you would want to do to the map for the most part. Um, I guess the people who develop this must be in Italy because it always defaults to Rome uh, when you start. <laughs> 
so you can zoom out and go to some place you care about, uh, like maybe Greenland. So I guess things to know that are annoying about this, um, they don't have like an Arctic or Antarctic projection view that I found. Um, so you're always gonna have like really weird distorted looking ice sheets. Um, and they also have like no background imagery up there. Um, so it's very helpful if you're trying to like find stuff to have either um, a coordinate of the area that you want that you can zoom in on or some kind of like AML file that like outlines the area of interest um, so that you can just like auto zoom to those. So if you want to zoom to coordinates, you can just like type them in this go to place option and search it and the map will zoom in on it. Um, if you have in like AOI file, this little like, uh, go away. Uh, this little polygon thing here will allow you to upload one. Um, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and so then that'll like outline the, your area of interest on the map and like zoom to it automatically, uh, which is nice. Uh, you can, I think, also like draw your own if you want. So when, so the way this thing like searches is that it's going to search for imagery that overlaps the view area on your screen. So like before you start searching for imagery, you want to zoom in on the area that you care about. Otherwise, it's going to like panic and try to load the whole globe or something, um, which is annoying. Uh, so once you do that, then you come over to the um, big left hand side. And so you start with the discover tab. Uh, and so this is where you set up telling it like what imagery you want to search for. So they have this whole list of data sources here. You can do more than one at a time, uh, but you can see here, you've got the Sentinel-1. So this would be the radar stuff we talked about. When you click on the little question mark, it will tell you um, exactly like what the data is and some things about the data. And you forget all of this later. Um, so they've got Sentinel-1, they've got Sentinel-2, um, three and five you won't care about. And then you've got the whole Landsat series. Um, so from one all the way through nine, these have sort of various overlapping time periods, probably for most of the stuff we do, like sort of Landsat 7 or Landsat 8 and 9 would be the ones that you'd want to look at. Um, you got MODIS and then some other stuff that's usually not that exciting. So we'll look at Sentinel 2 for now. Um, so you can just click on whatever you want to look at. Uh, you can turn on advanced search here. It's got usually some options. So like in the case of the optical imagery, you can set how much cloud cover you want to allow in the images that you're searching for, um, just so you don't like waste time pulling up stuff that's massively cloud cover. So I'm going to like drop it down to like 50. So the main problem here, right, is that it calculates cloud cover based on like the whole swath of the image. Um, so you don't want 100% cloud cover, but if you drop this down to like zero, if there's like one cloud and you like, you know, 40 kilometers, this thing's covered and you're covering and you're only interested in like one little area, it's also gonna like throw that image out. So you don't want to drop cloud cover like down too far initially. Um, otherwise you may just not see anything or be like, we have no images available for you. Um, okay, so Sentinel-2, the other two options you have is between this like L1C and L2A data. These are just various like levels of processing and correction um, for like just browsing the imagery. It doesn't matter. I almost always turn on L1C because that will expand the total catalog that you have. Um, so there might be images that they didn't process like to the L2A level yet that are around. Um, okay, yeah, so once you pick that, uh, then you just scroll all the way down to the bottom and you can set a time range that you're interested in viewing images over. There's also this filter by months option. Um, so like this one is useful if you're like, okay, I want data between say like 2010 and 2015, but I only want it in like the melt season. So like only show me, you know, in Greenland data from like June, July and August. So you can check that um, or you can just set specific dates. So I'm just gonna look at the melt season last summer. Um, so this, cause that's easy. Uh, so we'll set a two month period from beginning of July to end of August um, last summer. And then you click search and then it chugs around for a minute. Okay, and so then after you click search, it's gonna come up with this incredibly massive list of images. Um, and it's going to be very unclear what you should click on. The moral of the story is like, it doesn't matter because you're gonna be able to sort of sort through all of these images later in the interface. Um, so you just pick one to like start visualizing. They also have the footprints. Um, you can see sort of the overlapping footprints on the map. So. To, to actually start seeing images on the map, you can either click visualize on one of these boxes on the left, or you can click on one of these footprints and then click an image to visualize. Um, yeah, and so then once you do that, you actually have imagery um, that you can see uh, on your screen. So 
the first thing that I will say is that, okay, so now you'll, you should see like that this left box has gone from the discover tab to the visualize tab. So now we have some other tools. Um, it will always default for Sentinel to just showing you um, the true color image. So this is just like a combination of the red, green, and blue bands, um, same as if it was like a camera. I would recommend that you always switch it to highlight optimized natural color, um, where they've actually done a bit of like processing and balancing between the bands so you get something that looks more like a good picture. Um, otherwise, especially in the ice sheets, um, Sentinel 2 tends to look really, really washed out in their like true color composite. Um, and it's hard to see anything that's going on. So, all right, so we did that. Um, I'm actually gonna get rid of the AOI so we can see things. Yeah, so you should like now see something that looks, you know, pretty much like what you'd expect for ice sheet imagery. You know, we can see some lakes, see some streams, various stuff. Um, you can pan around and you're not stuck to the like initial AOI that you put in, you know, so if you zoom in and out or you pan to like other parts that will load in the imagery um, for those areas. All right. So we got this. So what is like very cool about this interface and makes it, in my opinion, the best browser is that you, you have this one image up for some random date. If you click on the calendar here, um, then it will show you sort of all of the available imagery, both going forwards and backwards for this location. So if one of the dates has a gray box around it, that means there's an image for that date um, you know, from that. And you can go you know, toggle between various months. Um, and so this is why I say it doesn't matter like what picture you click on in that initial visualization, because from here you can literally step through like date by date um, and look at stuff or like even go to a completely different time range than like what you initially selected. Um, yeah, if you want to do like a step date by date, the little um, arrows to the left and right of the calendar up here will do a day by day step through. Um, so you can that and you got to like wait for a minute for it to load. So sometimes, like in this case, it said we had an image on the 27th, but it's only like part of our AOI, not the, everything we're interested in. So, you know, maybe you've got to like go to a different date. This one's really cloudy, <laughs> so, but you can like see all of the images and step through them this way, uh, which is pretty useful. Yeah, so if you're just, I would say this is like the most useful functionality if you're just like, I want to look at this random fjord and like browse through a month and see if I see icebergs moving or something like that. Um, this is pretty useful. It's amazing, Riley. I'm so excited. This is my first time looking at <laughs> my own ice launch. <laughs> yeah, maybe I did. Um, so let's see here. So other cool things you can do with this tool, like we'll zoom in on this link, for example, you can do comparisons. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, okay. So if you have an image, you're on like an image for a particular date and you want to do a comparison like between two dates, this little like double arrow, thing. Um, if you click that, it'll add it to your compare window. And then you want to pick like another date in here somewhere. Uh, try to find one that's less cloudy. August was rough, apparently. Come on. Yeah, so this is, this is why uh, SAR is useful. OK, there we go. It's a nice one. OK, so you can add that to compare. So now if you go to the compare tab, um, you have either, you can basically do like a little, it does a slider. So you can like go back and forth uh, between the two, you know, dates and like compare stuff. You can also, so there's a split, you can also do an opacity version where you like fade different versions of the image in and out. Um, so this is kind of fun if you're trying to look at like feature evolution for something small. Uh, like that. All right. Yeah, so that's like most of the like how you see pictures type of stuff. Um, there are a bunch of tools over on the right um, you can also use. So I showed you guys, you can upload an area of interest. You can also like click and draw some kind of polygon, um, you know, for where you do your imagery searching here. Um, so, you know, they do squares or polygons. Uh, this is like a click to place a marker thing. So if you find a feature that's interesting, you can like you know, put a marker next to that. And then for example, go back and like change the type of imagery that you're looking at and then be able to like zoom back in on it pretty easily. Uh, there's a ruler, so you can click on that and just do offhand like, okay, this lake is three kilometers long. Um, it also does polygons, so you can get like estimates of area um, pretty quick with that as well. So there is a download button here um, when you're signed in. There are some, 
oddities to downloading out of this <laughs> system. So for starters, they give you three options. Um, basic download. Basic download is the equivalent of you just like screenshotting what you see like in your browser at that moment, except that like they have an interface for it instead of you doing the screenshotting. Um, so if you're just like trying to throw something in a PowerPoint, like that kind of does the trick, uh, you can do that. Analytical is if you wanted to actually in principle use the data in some way. Um, and so here they're gonna give you different options for like the file formats and like what bit depth you want on that. Um, you can choose what projection you want it in for like a GIS system. And I guess more specifically you can choose for example, so they have this raw option here. You could just download like a specific raw image band. So you're like, oh, for some reason you only wanted like the blue band out of it. You could just download BO2 or whatever it is. Um, or you can download these sort of visualized options. Um, so you could download a version of the highlight optimized natural color, like the one that you're looking at. So what I strongly dislike about this download option is this image resolution thing. So Sentinel-2, in this case, it's natural resolution um, is 10 meters by 10 meters for pixels. Here you will see that you have image resolution options of low, medium, and high, whatever that means, and also custom. And so if you go to custom, what you will discover is that there is a limit on the size of image you can export from this. It can only be a certain number of pixels, like wide and tall. And it's just auto going to export whatever like your screen view is at the time. And so like in this case, it's yelling at me because it's like, if I tried to export this at 10 meter by 10 meter pixels, it will be too many pixels for the size of this download. Um, and so if I wanted to like export it into natural resolution, I would have to like zoom massively in on the image. Um, so this is a terrible way to export at the natural resolution because you'd have to do it in like one kilometer by one kilometer blocks basically, <laughs> which is extremely annoying. But this does exist like if you had like one small feature that you were trying to get or if you didn't like super care about having it exactly at 10 meter resolution. Um, and then they have this high res print option, which is sort of another weird version of basic, but you can make the pictures bigger um, and more high resolution. So anyway, the point mainly is that you can download out of the system, but you should never download out of here for analysis. You should download out of this for like, PowerPoint pictures, um, you know, or if you're just trying to like show something off visually, but if you were like, oh, I want to calculate like NDWI, I want to like get a whole bunch of data to like look at this area for a bunch of dates, like, you know, be able to code something in MATLAB to like look at it, like this is not the place to get the data from. Um, okay, so what else have we got? Uh, okay, so then we have the time lapse button, and this is important if you're on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> so this is how you can get it to like automatically make GIFs of like, um, collections of images over time. Uh, so it has this little like blue box here, which is the area that it will make the GIF over to you, like center whatever you're interested in on that. And then you click the blue button um, and we wait for a minute while it loads everything. Uh, so then you can tell it like what set of dates you want it to include images in, like how many, what frequency of images you want. So do you, you know, if you, so if you put day, it'll take like every image that it can get up to a maximum of one image per day. Um, you know, but you could say maybe you only want like one a year or something. Set cloud coverage, tile coverage. So you could like drop down cloud cover and say like, okay, you know, throughout the images that are, you know, over 50%, um, you can set speed and FPS or whatever, a um, whole bunch of exact settings for your GIF that you can <laughs> do. But basically this will just, you know, run through all of the images in some kind of time lapse over the time period that you've set for it. Um, and yeah, then you can uh, hit download when you've got it set up the way you want and, you know, save it off somewhere and you've got your nice GIF for your talk or for your Twitter or whatever else you want to do. Close that. Uh, let's see here. Anything else? There's also a 3D button. I don't think it does anything on the ice sheets. Um, Maybe if you have the DEM layer pulled up, it would like do a thing, but it just, I think if you click on it in this view, it just turns into a giant fuzzy white nothingness. Um, so not super useful. Um, and then, yeah, there's a histogram button that only works if you have one of their like pre-calculated indices on. So like if, for example, you put on the normalized difference water index, so this is supposed to highlight things that are wet. Um, 
load that up. So things that are in blue are, are water. Um, so that works pretty nicely. Uh, but the histogram view will then like tell you the distribution of pixel values like in the area that you're zoomed in on, which is, I guess, minorly useful, but usually not that interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, all right. I think, so I think that is most of the capabilities of EO browser. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else that you guys are like, want to be able to do with searching for imagery that doesn't seem like it was covered with what I explained here or anything that I was showing off that didn't make sense how it gets used? Um, <clears throat> where can we get the DM data? DMs, okay. A um, couple of options. So there are some DEMs in here. So if you go back to search, there's the DEM option. Um, see which ones they have. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly which ones they include here. So I would say if you want good ice sheet DEM data, um, Polar Geospatial Center, either Arctic DEM for Greenland or RIMA, um, Reference Elevation Map of Antarctica, are probably the sort of best ones to use, um, <laughs> depending on your exact use case, they're the highest resolution. Um, but they're done with like stereo photogrammetry. Um, and so sometimes in parts of the ice sheet where everything is white, they aren't very good at determining the elevation uh, because there aren't a lot of features. <laughs> the features don't really look different from different angles. So it doesn't like show you much. Um, they also have some issues with sort of like absolute elevation referencing. Um, so if you care deeply about knowing the exact elevation, of the ice sheet surface, they can be problematic. Um, but if you just want to see like what the shape of it is, those get down to two meter postings. Um, so they're kind of the best. Uh, let's see here, I can pull that website up real quick. Show you guys what it is. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so this in general is a super useful website to know. Um, so Polar Geospatial Center, headquartered at the University of Minnesota, they have a whole bunch of stuff. So if you wanted, for example, to request the Maxar imagery, um, you could do that in here um, under their commercial satellite imagery page, but they also have elevation. Um, and so there's kind of two data sets they make available for Greenland, you have Arctic DEM. And so it has covers all of these areas in black, and let's see, that you should be able to just download pretty much directly um, from here. So yeah, if you scroll all the way down, um, usually what you want is the mosaic. So this is where they've taken images from a whole bunch of dates um, and combined them together into like complete coverage. And you can download that at various resolutions. Um, so usually down to like, mm, yeah, like the one kilometer and 500 meter DEM is like you could download the whole ice sheet at once. These lower resolution ones, you'll have to go in and like find the particular tile that covers the area you're interested in, and then like go and download the tile. Um, and these get large really fast. So if you want two meter DEMs, these are often like a gigabyte per tile. So just like have a large hard drive or some space available if you go in to download those. Uh, but you can get sort of much lower uh, deal of like you're doing the one kilometer DEMs or something. Uh, and then you've got a similar thing for Antarctica, which is under Rima here. And it's basically, yeah, same stuff. So if you scroll down, you can get kind of the same set of products, but for Antarctica, same deal with the tiles. Uh, I guess one thing that is useful to know, if you're interested in DEMs for like surface elevation change, the mosaics can be problematic because they're just like collating data from a whole bunch of different dates to try to get the best possible spatial coverage. If you want to look at change in time for an area, what you're going to want is their strip map coverage. Um, so you want to look for the strips here. So these are like the individual DEMs that come from a single like strip of imagery taken like at a given date. Um, and so you can, for these, you can download a shape file that shows you like the footprint of all of those strips that they have collected over time. And so you can look at your area of interest and see like what dates they have strips on and then like download the specific strips to do comparisons. Um, yeah, they're a little problematic um, because the absolute like elevation 
referencing is not amazing um, on this product, uh, but it's like a nice start and it's kind of the only 2D thing that's out there that has like time series um, for DMs. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Olivia, are you, besides DMs, are you also interested in like the ISAT two type of stuff, the altimetry things where you get elevation just along like a single profile, um, but not like an entire surface DEM. Yeah, I think I will I will be interested in that as well. Okay. Cool. Uh, wait, so sorry, just before we move on to that, I have one question. Yeah. There's in the on this page here, this downloads, there's a the you can do the, the shape file. What is GDB and uh, GPKG? Are those useful? Or are they just like a different format of the same data? But shape files are what we usually use. Yeah, different format of the same um, file. So this one is a geo database. So if you specifically use S3 products and want it okay. in like a database, that's the version of the geo package is like a compressed version of the geo database. Again, like somewhat S3 specific. Um, okay. So you, like if you're using ArcMap, you could download any of these and, yeah. use them and it wouldn't matter. Um, for, but I would recommend just getting a shape file like that's Which is how you deal with it in MATLAB stuff. probably or Python or whatever. Yeah. 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 If okay. you're not using Nestor, then I would definitely use the shape file. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. If there, if people are interested in the altimetry stuff, I can also pull up the portal for that and show you guys that real quick. Um, seem good. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Pull that one up. Um, like most things, there are many ways to get the altimetry, but I think. For laser altimetry anyway, this open altimetry.org page is kind of the one that I prefer. Um, if you have thoughts on this, Niall, also feel free to bust in because I think you've been doing a bunch of ISAT stuff. <laughs> um, but this one, I would say this one is like nice for browsing um, because it has the map view um, and you can just kind of go through the data without having to know a lot about like file namings or anything crazy. Um, so they have both ISAT and ISAT2. Um, these just cover different time periods. Uh, I don't remember the exact dates off the top of my head, but like ISAT2 was, I think like, I think it's like roughly like 2000 to 2008-ish. And then ISAT was a more recent launch. So I think this one is like 2018 to present. Um, and then there's a gap in the middle. If you want that altimetry, then you need the Operation Icebridge data that was flown on aircraft. That is another data portal. Um, <laughs> which I can also send links to. Um, and then that one's more annoying to use. But anyway, we can browse ISAT2 for the moment because that one has a little bit more data. Uh, yeah, so with this, basically the idea is that altimetry, right, is only getting an elevation along like uh, a line right underneath the satellite as it goes along. And so what you end up seeing in these views in the portal are like the satellite tracks that they make as they pass around the earth. And so you can zoom in on a track and get like the profile from that track is the idea. Uh, this one, thankfully, because they do have, you know, Arctic people on their design has separate views for Arctic and Greenland um, projections, which is nice. So you can, you know, do that. We'll do Greenland for the moment. Um, yeah, and so basically if you zoom in on here, um, it doesn't initially give you a lot of tracks. Um, so one of the things you probably wanna do besides waiting a minute is switch it on the right side here to ATL 06. Um, so this is just like the standard terrain like elevation profile um, product for land ice specifically. Um, I think it tends to default to ATL08, which is like the land product for the tropics or like other lands that are not ice. Um, so you probably want to be on ATL06. Uh, and then there is this big select a region button. Uh, so usually you want to use that to like select the set of tracks that you're interested in. Um, and then you can kind of zoom in on that. So similar to um, what I showed you with EO browser, you can also drag and drop like KML or shape files um, on top of this so that it, like if you're like, oh, I specifically want to track like over this lake or something or like over this iceberg, you can like, you know, outline it in some other tool and like drag that file in here so that you'll cut it down to like just the tracks that are in the area that you're interested in. Um, okay. And so then, yeah, on the left side, you've got some filters. 
this option to filter by beam. Um, so this is because with the altimetry, um, they've got sort of multiple lasers that are looking at like offset locations underneath the track. So each of these single tracks are, actually has like three profiles associated with it. There's a middle one, a left one, and a right one. And each profile has like two versions, a strong beam and a weak beam. Um, so that's how you get these six here. I would just leave them all on because um, it gets you better like coverage. Um, you can filter by track if you happen to like know the specific track number you're looking for. I never do, but I guess if you were like trying to, if you knew that or like trying to get someone else's data where they had given you a track number, you can filter by that. Uh, you can also filter by dates. I also never do this because I never know what date like my area is going to have data in. Um, so I think what's usually more useful is like once you select a region, um, then you can go in and like usually you can go in and like click on the tracks. Um, and so when you click on one and successfully select it, it turns green and it will have these little dots, which are indications of like where there's photon returns associated with this track. So this one, for whatever reason sucks, it must've been on like a super, super cloudy day or something. And there's like actually no data. Um, but then here it will tell you what dates they actually have data on that track. And you can like filter by date here, which is much more useful. Um, so you can like pick a different one. Okay, so like this date actually had all the data. So you can see here, even though like you have a single track, you actually have these three separate like profile coverages, um, which is a little bit confusing when you're trying to figure out like whether the track goes through the feature that you're interested in. Um, so like if you pull it up, you know, and you're like, oh, I want to know if it like goes over this lake, even if it doesn't look like it goes over the lake, just like click on the track and see where the left and right beams are. Cause then sometimes they're offset enough that you like got coverage on a thing. Um, so once you have this up, um, you also get this little bar that says like view elevation profile, view signal photons. Um, so if you click on this, it takes you out to another page. Um, let's see, yeah, okay. Hopefully you guys can see the elevation profiles now that pop up for you. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this then gives you like a plot visualization of the elevation profile along that track in the region of interest that you'd selected. Um, and so you can see here the different elevation profiles for each of those offset beams. Um, so there's that. Um, you, this is the HL06. You can scroll down and see like had they processed it under you know the other properties, what would it look like? It should be about the same. You probably just want to use this one anyway. You can also click on photon heights to um, look in a little bit more detail. So this is actually giving you like every, for the most part, like every photon that bounced back um, to the laser instead of their like pre-processed, pre-filtered version of the surface elevation. Um, and then you can like select which beam, you know, you're interested in looking at up there and it'll pop up with those. Uh, what is nice about this though, um, is if you go down to like the bottom of this line, there's this option to like download data as CSV or a subsetted HDF5. And so if like all you want is like, oh, I just want these like elevation profiles exactly as they are here, but for me to do my own analysis in MATLAB or something, you just click on this and you like get a CSV file that's got all of the data in it. Um, so yeah, for like small scale altimetry stuff, I think this is like by far the most convenient way because you can just see if there's actually good data directly like subset it to the area that you're interested in and then download it in these like super lightweight CSV files um, from here, which is pretty convenient. If you legitimately just want like every track over an area over the entire time that it's flown or something, you might be better off downloading through National Snow and Ice Data Center, NSIDC, which is kind of like the back end place where all of the data lives and gets archived. Um, and so, yeah, they have some various other options for more like large scale downloading or doing that in a more automated fashion where you can like run a script to download it. But it's like a little bit more complicated to learn than this one, which is really good for just toying with it. Cool. I would add real quick, um, if we go back to the last tab, mm -hmm. not usually useful, but sometimes it can be if you're interested in really local like transverse to um the flight path you can click like get api url or the 3d viewer um so either is going to just open up like a 3d version of those tracks so you can kind of see them together um and if people are interested i have a modified version of the api uh link and it can use that when you give it the data that you download to just make this sort of a map in Python. Nice. 
That's pretty awesome. I've actually never used the 3D view before, but there you go. The margins of the Greenland ice sheet are uh, pretty varied, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's been fun with some of the stuff I've looked at when thinking of like trying to get some estimate of like fracture extent. Like you can see it sort of move up or down as you get closer to the edges of it. And you're like, oh, cool, it's tapering off or whatever. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, let's open altimetry. Uh, I don't know. Other questions, other data sources we didn't talk about? Um, after this, I can just post like, a big link to the actual URLs for like PGC and open altimetry and stuff. Um, if you didn't get a oh, chance. That's what I was just going to ask. Cause I will, I will forget the name, but I will yeah. remember the Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll add them to the end of the Google doc, um, and some other resources. Um, then I actually there. have a, a, a fairly dumb question. Like, obviously I know that operation ice bridge exists, but like where in history did it exist and why? Okay, so it exists because of this gap between ISAT and ISAT2. That's why it is called okay. Ice Bridge. Uh, yeah. So it exists mainly from 2009 to 2019, sort of plus okay. minus a year on the edges, depending on the particular instrument that you care about. Um, but it's in that gap. Um, and so if you want land ice altimetry between 2009 and roughly 2019, that is your only option. There is no satellite version of laser altimetry during that time. Um, there are radar altimeters. There's other options there. Um, but so there's that high period. And then if you want like airborne radar, it only exists during that time because we flew it as an extra thing on the planes um, in addition to, to the sort of stated purpose, which was having this laser altimetry gap coverage. Um, and then where the, would you get that? Okay, so there is the... A little bit on what you want. Um, the main portal that I would suggest for starters is this Operation Ice Bridge portal. I can show that real quick. It loads. Okay, it's only having a minorly bad day. Me too. All right. Yeah. So it's not even there. Keep. And this IDC has been like changing everything. Um, this was not the portal that I wanted. Hang on. Um, way too many links. There we go. All right. So this is the one with the map, which is what I wanted. Uh, oh. So so this is like very similar to kind of everything that I've been showing you today, where there's a map, there's a whole bunch of tracks from data. You can sort the data like by time or by instrument or by spatial location, mm -hmm. like download stuff. Um, yeah, so this is Antarctica. They've also, if you switch it to North, then you get the Greenland view. Um, yeah, the, probably the most confusing thing about this one is just that there are like a ton of different instruments that were flown on all of the OIB flights. And so you usually want a subset sort of not only by like date and by location, but also by the instrument that you're looking at here. Um, if you know what instrument you want, the easiest way to do that is just do like a free text keyword search. It's like, I want, uh, you know, ATM, for example, that's the laser one. And then it'll only give you the ATM data. Uh, but sort of, yeah, similarly here, um, you know, the tracks show up, you subset to a specific area, you could do a temporal filter. And then this one is having a bad day today, but usually you can, uh, you should be able to sort of hover over the tracks and it will like highlight the different segments that the data is broken up into and then add those to your like download data option here. Um, yeah, it's, so this one is decent. This is usually what I use for the ATM data. So for the laser altimetry from IceBridge, um, if you specifically want the radar data, I usually don't go through IceBridge. I go through Cresus at the University of Kansas. Um, so they've got uh, their own portal page here uh, that just only has the radar data. 
And so you can go to a particular instrument and then just go directly to like an FTP style site where you like grab the data that you want. Uh, it doesn't have the map view, which is like a little bit more annoying. Um, but if you go into the folders, this KML um, folder option will have like all of the tracks broken out. So the way I usually do IceBridge like um, radar stuff is that I just downloaded all of the KMLs once and have them in like Google Earth Pro on my computer um, and like look up what I want there and then just come in here to download it, uh, which is usually a little bit easier. It depends also on the file format that you want. So for some reason, if you download the radar data through the NSIDC um, OIB data portal, so this one, you'll get it in NetCDF format. If you download it here, you get it directly in map files. Um, so if you care deeply about which one you use or like have a workflow that's already written to more easily ingest one or the other of those formats, like that is actually a difference in what you get between the two. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, you should get mostly the same stuff. There's potentially slightly more data on the Cresus site because uh, they just post everything that they process. Whereas I think there was like some slight next level of like vetting and having to turn in NetCDF files and stuff to get it on the OIB portal. Um, so in principle, there may be stuff that have like fallen through the gaps there, um, or it may take longer to show up on this portal. Uh, I think they probably have the 2019 stuff in here now, um, hopefully. But you know, if there's stuff that's like missing here that like you think should exist, it might just be on the Greases portal and like didn't make it the next step. Um, can we go through how to use the Google Engine? So I haven't used Google Engine before, and I saw y'all sent some codes in the group chat. Yeah. So I will show it to you. Like, how to use it would probably be like a two-hour tutorial by itself, um, because you have to like learn to code in JavaScript um, <laughs> to do it. <laughs> but I'll show you what it looks like, and get, I can like run a script or two of mine to give you a sense of what it does um, and then send you some like getting started like tutorial links um, if you want to play around with it. So yeah, see if I am signed into the right Google account. I am not. All right. So sorry, we're going to I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment and figure out how to get signed into the Google account that I have attached to my Google Earth engine um, and then we will get it again. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have to have a Google account to do this. I maybe somewhat foolishly like linked it to my Stanford Google account uh, when I made one initially. So that like you know goes away when you graduate and stuff. Um, they make it sound like you're like you technically have to like apply to get a Google Earth Engine account, and they make it sound like you're more likely to get it if you seem like affiliated with real research and not just like a person screwing around. Um, but it's like a little unclear how much that actually matters what email address you use. Um, but something to consider, I guess if you, it might be more convenient to have it under your personal as far as it just like following you from institution to institution. Um, but I guess if they like give you crap about it, put it on your institutional account. Um, let's see if I can sign in now. Okay. All right. So this is Google Earth Engine. Um, yeah. So if you want to, okay. So in the Google Doc, um, this like on the fly analysis stuff is some links related to using Google Earth Engine. So if you haven't signed up for it yet, just you know go to this like first link because uh, that's kind of the main landing page, and they've got a big sign up link in the top corner. So you got to put in some info. Um, they like ask you what you're going to use it for. And I think it technically undergoes like some review process in the back end. So I can't remember exactly how long it took me to get an account, but it might be a like 24 hour process kind of thing. Um, so it, I don't think it's quite instantaneous. Um, yeah, so this is here. This is also useful because they have a list of like all of the data sets that are available linked from this page. Um, that you may want to look at is okay. So the the main advantage to Google Earth Engine is that a bunch of people who provide public data sets like NASA and NISA have 
all of their data sort of linked in the back end to Google Earth Engine. And so you can do analysis directly on the data in the cloud without having to download anything. Right. So if you're you're just like, I want to like detect every lake in Greenland Landsat imagery from 1972 to now, instead of downloading like three petabytes of Landsat imagery or whatever, you can just run it on the cloud for free in this, which is pretty amazing. Um, but that's like the, I would say is like the main use case. Like this is why you go to start using Google Earth Engine is because you want to do like long time series actual analysis or like use a whole bunch of data over a large spatial area or you like hit this point where you're like downloading is, is frustrating or like expensive or taking a lot of time or a lot of space. Um, so like I said, they have a whole bunch of data sets in here. So this data catalog is really useful because you can scroll through this and see like everything that you can call up in the code editor to work on here. Um, and it's, yeah, really pretty massive. Um, you know, so like some of the stuff that we were looking at, can't spell before, so you could like pull up, yeah. So you could pull up Sentinel-2, for example, here. Um, yeah, so like Sentinel-2, level 2A, that's the same stuff we were looking at in Neo Browser. So like they have this in Google Earth Engine as well. Um, the data catalog is also very useful because besides sort of telling you all about the metadata, um, you know, everything here, they also have code snippets that tell you like if you just want to like access this imagery, you know, you can like copy and paste this code snippet in to like get started with using that data source. Um, so the data catalog is like very useful for this. Um, yeah, because like when you look at Google Earth Engine, basically you have a map on the bottom and up top you have an area for writing scripts. You have like a little console like terminal that you know tells you what happens when you run it, uh, when you run your script. And then you have this like tree. This is basically like your file structure over here on the left. Um, so you have scripts, um, which you save in these like repositories here. So this is like the code that you write to interact with it. Um, you also have assets. So like if you have your own, I have a bunch of like shape files in various places on the Greenland ice sheet that I like wanted to use to like subset data. So you can like upload those to Google Earth Engine. They, they go into assets here and then you can use them in scripts. Um, yeah, so like the, in this case, like the only way that you interact with data here is through scripting. There's no like UI option where you can like click and like automatically view imagery or something. Like you have to write a little bit of code to do it. Uh, so let's see if I've got good like yeah so this is like one example um yeah so like in this one what i was trying to do was like take all of the landsat imagery um over some time period and like calculate the normalized difference water index on it like display that um here let me comment out of the export to drive option gonna run it and see what it does Yeah, so in this case, what this code does is it gets the entire collection of Landsat 8 imagery. Um, and then I have a function here that uh, will go through and it masks out clouds, um, calculates the normalized difference index between band 5 and band 3, um, which is how you get this water index. And then you like you update your imagery. Um, this is another cloud masking function. And so you can basically go through. So you take all your landsat and imagery. Here I spatial it, filter, filter it spatially on this like table three, which is this polygon here. Then I filter it that I only want to look at 2021, only look at June, July, August, cloud cover less than this percent. Um, then you you know can apply the like NDWI function, and then I do a compositing, um, right? Because they still have like all of the imagery that falls in those bounds. So you can like smash them all together. So here I'm saying it each pixel gives me the maximum of NDWI like across all of those images. Um, and then you can write a little bit of code to display that and have it like show up um, down here. And you know if you want to like export this data to like put into a GIS for making figures or to do like some other analysis um, for some reason in MATLAB that you like felt like you couldn't do here, um, you can write this little like export function that will save it to whatever Google Drive is associated with the account that you use here. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I would recommend if you wanna get started with this, like the good thing is, is that this is extremely popular in the remote sensing community. So it's very easy to Google for like tutorials or YouTube videos or like code snippets. 
um, for getting started with running this. Or in this case, like, you know, Yao posted a, a script so you can just like snag her script and like run it under your account to do something, um, which is useful. Uh, I will post a link to a like online virtual textbook basically for getting started with using Google Earth Engine that has a bunch of labs that you can walk yourself through, um, kind of explains how to use it. Um, it does take a little getting used to though. So I think there's a Python interface that I have not figured out how to use yet, but if you're just like coding in this window here, it's basically in JavaScript, um, which I definitely didn't know any of before I started using Google Earth Engine. So that's like a thing to overcome. Um, and it's a little bit different style of coding than probably most of you are used to. Um, I don't know, Yangju, you're, you may be the exception here, but it's this is all like functional style programming. So you're not writing like for loops for things. Um, you are like mapping functions over collections of objects or like running reduce functions on objects. Um, you know, so like if you had, we have this like whole collection of Landsat MRD, you have this like object that references all of that. And then the way that you do analysis is you write functions that you can then apply to every like instance of a thing in that collection. Um, so, you know, it's not not terribly complicated, but it's a little bit different way of thinking about how doing programming works than if you're used to sort of like, oh, I just write a for loop, like iterate over stuff. Um, so that's why it's worth sort of going through some of the tutorials and like code snippet stuff to understand like how to apply things here. So occasionally it gets really annoying. You're like, I just wanted to like add one to every pixel in this or something and that <laughs> you have to write this like whole little function to do that. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, if, if Riley, you have some online, online like a source to help us how to learning to do the coding on the Google engine, that would be very helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, I totally agree with what, what you said before. I think in a way they do is more like a like a classical way of image processing. That's why you have to really apply different function. That's how I review that I have to, they have based on the particular data set they have. You have to do a lot of like a filtering or kind of like a organizing of the data in order to get in the one that you want. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, functional programming is really well suited to this sort of thing, which is why it's yeah, yeah. that way. Um, but yeah, I think if you're, you're more of like a MATLAB coder, <laughs> then it might not be <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. you've seen a lot of before. Yeah, so I've got a link to this um, here in the Google Doc. Um, there's this really awesome web page, cloud-based remote sensing with Google Earth Engine, which is basically, it's written kind of like a textbook, but it's like all online. It has um, these like video chapter summary things. It's got a whole bunch of these like, you know, yes, it's got the videos. It's got all of these little like training tutorial like labs that you can like walk yourself through. Um, so I think, yeah, this is like, if you want to get into it seriously, like working your way through this, at least like as far as you find interesting um, is a very nice way to get started. And we'll get, I guess like this will get you started the right way in the sense of like, you, you will actually learn how it is doing things. <laughs> um, the alternate way is to like Google Indian YouTubers and like get their code snippets from their tutorial page which if you just need to get something done, will also do the trick. Um, <laughs> but you may learn less about the fundamentals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there are like, yeah, it, it's very easy to Google just like, how do I do this thing in Google Earth Engine? And there will be like 16 people's like, you know, Stack Exchange page or something with like code snippets for it, which is really nice. Um, they also have pretty good documentation. Um, I'll find the link for that and drop it in the Google Doc as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but their documentation sort of not only lays out what the functions does, but usually has like examples of how the functions are used and some like little tutorial examples like in the documentation. If, if you don't want to go through the whole book, you could sort of start with those. It's like very basic rundown of how to get started with it. But yeah, it's not too bad. I think like I, I figured out how to do like basic stuff in this in like a week from not having used it before. Yeah, I think as long as they give examples, so we can just try to mimic all the function I use. I'm just trying to, as long as we see more examples, so we should be going to at least do some basic stuff that we want to do. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of examples out there. And I'll I'll find the link for the documentation because that's got some good ones for like the simple cool. stuff that everybody wants to do. Yeah. Cool. All right. 
everyone happy? Have lots of excitement. Yeah, oh, you can talk. It's very informative. Yeah, this is great. And that cheat sheet will be super, super helpful. Uh, yeah. That you can pull together. Cool. I will well, just thank you add some more links to that for the stuff that we talked about. Sweet. Cool. Thank you so much, Professor Kohlberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Great. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah. Have yeah, fun. Thanks, post post thanks cool so gifs much. on uh, Slack. <laughs> 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 oh, and I, and I really like the um the the what you might, the logo with the modified color with the red uh, percent. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Cool. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. All right. Perfect.